Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming um, on behalf of Leo Beck Institute. Um, my name is David Brown. I'm director of history, uh, public history for Leo Beck Institute. And I want to welcome you all to our first in-person panel discussion um, in at least two years. Um, so we're really thrilled to all be um, in a room together uh, with new faces and, and familiar faces uh, talking about Jewish history here at the Center for Jewish History. Um, so thank you very much for making the trip out. And to those of you watching on Zoom or YouTube or Facebook, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you're in the a New York area, I hope you'll consider joining us in person for uh, upcoming programs that we have here at LBI and the Center for Jewish History. Um, and I would just raise to your attention that we currently have an exhibition um, in the Goldsmith Gallery upstairs on the mezzanine level um, about the history of uh, the Theresienstadt ghetto concentration camp. Um, so I uh, also need to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the YIVO Institute for Jewish, Jewish Research and the Center for Jewish History. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Leo Beck Institute is a library and archive focused on the history of German-speaking Jews, but we work together here in this building with organizations like YIVO and uh, American Jewish Historical Society, American Sephardi Fe Federation, and Yeshiva University Museum, um, maintaining um, these world-class research collections uh, that cover really the, in the entire globe of uh, Jewish history. Um, and doing public programming like this, and hopefully doing more of it soon. Um, tonight we have a little bit of a different focus than, um, uh, than the territory that LBI usually covers. We're, we'll be talking about Hungarian Jewry, or more specifically, Budapest Jew Jewry, and the extraordinary cultural achievement of a generation of Jews from Budapest. Um, but I think it'll become clear in the discussion why LBI is also interested in this topic as an institute interested in German-speaking Jews. Um, we're going to hear stories tonight about a fertile amalgam of identities, languages, and cultures in Budapest in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which really resonate in, in the same key as the stories uh, that LBI often tells uh, about the other parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, that we usually focus on. So you, know, you could take uh, Budapest and compare it to Prague or Vienna, for instance. Um, we'll also hear stories of survival, displacement, emigration, and exile, and coming to terms in the past, um, which in some cases rhyme neatly with the experiences of uh, German and Austrian Jews, and in some cases provide an interesting counterpoint. Um, and indeed, sometimes they're the exact same stories. Um, so you've probably noticed that there are only two chairs on stage but we advertised three speakers, and I'm terribly sorry to say Kati Martin is unable to participate tonight. Um, we had a fabulous preparation call with her this morning. Um, it was a tremendous discussion. I really regret that she can't be here, um, but in all conscientiousness, she tested herself for COVID uh, and had a positive test, although she seems to be symptom free, but of course, um, didn't want to expose anyone. Um, so we thank her and, and wish her uh, a, a further symptom-free recovery. Um, and um, nevertheless, we have two uh, fantastic speakers tonight who could easily fill up uh, tonight and uh, the next several weeks talking about this history, and they could do it in Hungarian. Um, but for our benefit, they're, they're not going to, for those of us who don't speak Hungarian. Um, but let me introduce them, and then, and then I'll get out of the way and let the discussion begin. Um, so first, uh, our moderator, Raphael Pastor, and also the initiator of this event. I've been talking to Raphael for almost three years about this, and um, our plans were initially scuttled by COVID, um, uh, but we didn't let it, let it stop us, and I'm very happy that we're able to put this program on tonight. Raphael is a former business executive and currently a member of various boards who was born in Israel to Holocaust-surviving Hungarian parents and emigrated to the United States when he was nine years old. In 2018, a book called Entertaining Between Worlds, Bella Pastor, 1895 to 1996, and his era uh, was published about the life and times of Raphael's father, 
a prominent Jewish Hungarian theater and film director and a journalist who worked in Hungary, Israel, and Germany. Um, it's a very substantial book. I didn't even have room to, to put it on the podium here. Um, it's fascinating. It's full of photographs. And um, Raphael brought several copies with him. Um, and uh, it invites you, if you're interested, to take one free of charge. And after they run out, um, we have a sign-up sheet. And uh, he's offered to ship them to, to people who are interested in the book. So I recommend taking advantage of that. Um, and now I'll set that down. Um, And he, uh, Raphael, um, of course, had a, his own um, very interesting and successful career in media, um, education, financial services. He was the chairman of the board and CEO of Vistage International, the world's largest for-profit CEO membership company. And he held CEO or president and other senior executive positions at Hoyt Cinema Corporation, USA Networks, uh, News Corporation, Fox Television, and CBS Fox Video. So this isn't his first time moderating a panel discussion either. Um, Andras Kerner uh, will be in conversation with Raphael. Uh, Andras was born in Budapest where he studied architecture in 1967. He continued his career as an architect in the United States. But since his retirement, he dedicates his time to writing richly illustrated social histories and organizing exhibitions related to Jewish life in Hungary. Uh, so his most recent book, uh, also quite substantial, but a, a little bit more manageable, Jewish Cuisine in Hungary, A Cultural History with 83 Authentic Recipes, won the National Jewish Book Award in 2019. Um, I believe it's just come out in Hungarian uh, or in Hungary. The other, the other way around, it came out in Hungary first, and now it's available in English uh, and also here tonight. Um, if you're interested, see us afterwards. Um, uh, it's available for sale along with Anrash's other two books about uh, social, uh, social history about Jewish daily life in Hungary. Um, two volumes, also large with lots of pictures and, and fascinating stories. Um, those are for sale too, and uh, we'd love it if you uh, checked them out and maybe got them signed. Um, and um, I want to invite Andras and Raphael to the stage now. Uh, to take it away, and then after that, we'll do some Q&A with the audience here and also online. Um, and then we'd like to join you outside for a brief reception. So, thank, thank you. you David. First of all, thank you all for being here. Um, I think it's great that this is the first time um, this organization has had everybody here in person. We can all celebrate that in, the, in itself. Um, I'm told by David that there are uh, something like 400 people registered to not be here in person, but to see this through streaming or other, uh, other ways like Zoom. So I hope many of those are out there listening in. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't single out one person, and that's um, Bob Rifkin, who I know is listening in. Bob's a good friend. Uh, and Bob was the initiator, really, of this whole thing. Uh, Bob and I go back a long, long time. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight, but he's on the board of um, the Leo Beck Institute. And when I sent him this book that David mentioned, uh, he said they really should do something about this over there. And that's how this whole thing started about three years ago. Um, I also want to echo what David said about the great regret uh, both Andras and I have, and I'm sure you will share, that um, Kathy Martin couldn't be here. We really did have a fabulous morning session uh, we prob probably covered almost everything we're going to talk about here tonight, <laughs> and only about an hour, hour and a half later, uh, she shared with us the news that uh, she had tested herself positive for COVID and obviously couldn't be here. I, I will try as best as I can to represent what some of what she would have said had she been here. I will, I will bring to all of your attentions, uh, she wrote a book called The Great Escape, which I uh, just reread uh, in the last few days. Uh, uh, before, of course, I knew that she couldn't be here tonight. And I commend it to you because uh, it is a book that profiles nine different, very, very prominent, influential Hungarian Jews who, because of all that was going on in Hungary, some of which we'll discuss, fled. And as a result uh, of being abroad, mostly in the United States, one of them in England, they did amazing things because of who they were. 
There's Alex Korda, who founded the film, uh, the whole film industry in England, for example, about whom much has been written. There's Edward Teller, who really invented the uh, hydrogen bomb. There's uh, Szilard and von Neumann, who were at the core of developing the atom bomb, great physicist. Wigner, who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Cord, uh, uh, Robert Kappa, a great photographer, considered the greatest world, time, uh, world war photographer ever. All Hungarians. Uh, Andrei Kertes, uh, the, the great Hungarian photographer in the United States. And of course, uh, Kerner, who wrote Darkness at the Noon, which many people consider to be one of the greatest books ever written uh, about fascism and uh, uh, Soviet totalitarianism. All of them Hungarian Jews who escaped, all of them profiled, not just in terms of their lives, but what they have in common, some of which we'll talk about today. So I commend this book to you, and, and I know that I'm making an even more outright pitch for it than Kathy ever would have done, <laughs> um, because she's probably more modest than, than, than I am about this book. But I, I do regret she won't be here. I will, from time to time, make reference to some of the things in this book as they pertain to our conversation. And, and to kick it off, um, I, I, you know, it, it's interesting because what we're going to be talking about today are people who fled, became refugees abroad because of some terrible, terrible things happening in their homeland, which in this case was Hungary and particularly Budapest. But I'd be remiss if I didn't also draw some kind of a parallel to what's going on today in Ukraine. In Ukraine, you now have, in a way that I think none of us would have imagined even three months ago, uh, somewhat of a repeat of what was going on back there. A terrible, terrible invasion, a humanitarian crisis, and a flood, a flood of refugees. Last I, re I read, over 50 million, 5 million, sorry, uh, refugees have fled Ukraine uh, into places like Poland, Moldova, Hungary, et cetera. And there are parallels there, I don't want to overdraw them, between what you're going to hear about in Hungary. And I, I would suspect, only time will tell, that some of the consequences of what's going on, particularly with the refugees, is that there's going to be a big brain drain out of Ukraine into the rest of the world. And some of the people who are now fleeing, who don't choose to go back, will probably have great impacts on the worlds that they inhabit outside of the Ukraine. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And, and I'm really pleased and honored that I have with me here Andras Kertes, uh, who knows a lot more about this than I do. Kerner. Uh, I'm sorry, Kerner. Um, <laughs> only because there are two Kertes's in Kati's book, I apologize. But Andras and I, we could do this in Hungarian, by the way. He was born in Hungary. I was not. Uh, I was born in Israel. My parents were hung from Hungary. At home, we spoke Hungarian. And to this day, I speak pretty fluent Hungarian. But for your benefit, we're going to do this in English. Um, and I thought as an opening salvo, uh, Andras, uh, tell me why it is that you're even interested in this subject of uh, what is it about your background that interests you in this subject of Hungarian Jewish identity and what happened to all those folks? Well, uh, I always knew that, that uh, I was born a Jew or uh, uh, I was Jewish considering that I can remember the ghetto in Budapest and the Swiss protected house and the yellow star house and all, all the uh, stuff that is related to it. But honestly, I was not particularly interested in it until age 35 or so because I thought it's a fact, it's a part of my life, but one should not make it the, the very center of my life. There are other things in life. And uh, at age 35, I started to record my mother's oral history. And she had an amazing ability to remember minute microscopic details of life with her grandmother, my great-grandmother, at the very beginning of, of the 20th century in a small town near the Austrian border. And how they celebrated the holidays. They were religious Jews. They still kept kosher and uh, this drew me in and somehow made this whole thing much more central to me as, as it had been before and uh, I started researching it and reading up on it and uh, translating my 
great grandmother's recipes and letters which she wrote in the 1860s and 1870s. And gradually I, I was sucked into it. And uh, after I retired at age 63, I started writing books, mostly about uh, the everyday life, lives of uh, Hungarian Jews and, uh, and their kitchen. My first book was about my great-grandmother's household, but it was not a family history. It was uh, because I wrote it because I knew so much about her and lots of artifacts and letters and uh, just, just a huge amount of information I had about her, though I've never met her. And uh, then later on, this, this first book was sort of like a microcosm about one woman. And later on, this I followed up this with uh, two volumes of the everyday life of the lots of different Jews who lived in Hungary, uh, sort of instead of the microcosm, a macrocosm. And, um, and then also a book about uh, Hungarian Jewish cuisine, not a cookbook, but a, um, a cultural history of, um, the cu of culinary culture, which again expanded my first book about my great-grandmother to encompass um, all the different uh, groups, Jewish groups in Hungary. So that's it. And now I'm here. I, I can tell you that uh, had, had Kati been here and been asked that question, she would have told you that she herself was born in Hungary. Her parents were very prominent folks who ended up in the United States as journalists and in other professions. She wrote a book about them and their plight and that prompted her curiosity about other prominent Hungarians who left Hungary, and that led to this book, The Great Escape. Uh, in my own case, um, w this whole subject kind of is relatively new to me. I really hadn't focused on it or been particularly interested in it until about four years ago. Uh, this woman named Anna Salai, who had been a professor in Hungary of uh, cultural history, et cetera, and then en ended up emigrating to Israel, uh, somehow got a, uh, a hold of me, tracked me down, uh, got on the phone with me. We spoke Hungarian to each other because she speaks Hebrew, I don't, and she doesn't speak English. And she said to me, look, I've become fascinated with the story of your father. I've done a bunch of research. I want to do a book on him. And I said, well, tell me about it. And we stayed on the phone for an hour and a half. And at the end of that, I said to her, you've told me more about my father than I ever knew. Because I didn't. My father died when I was 16. And I said, by all means, do write this book. I'll be happy to underwrite it, though she didn't ask me to do that. And that it led to this book. And what this book did for me, and I think for my children, maybe even my grandchildren, it gave me a real sense of um, the history of my father, but even more importantly, of the environment and the culture uh, that he lived in, uh, his, his era. And uh, it opened up my eyes to things I never knew. And one of the great things about organizations such as this one and about books like that and about oral history, which you mentioned, is that it preserves not only the history of it, but it gives it to the next generation and the generations beyond. Uh, and in the introduction to this book, which Anna wrote and researched, I didn't, I did write a foreword. And I put in that foreword, which I think is true not just for the Holocaust survivors, but for many other kids of people who survived some really bad things. And that is that very often, very often, kids don't ask and parents don't tell. Kids don't ask and parents don't tell. Partly because kids don't have this curiosity sometimes to really ask the probing questions. And often because the parents don't want to talk about it. It's not pleasant. It's a bad, bad part of their past. And for whatever reason, um, that happens, I think, very often. And for me, this book um, was a chance not so much to ask the questions, but to get some of those answers that I otherwise would not have had. Um, I want to join, move now to really the heart of what we want to talk about, and that is this whole idea of Jewish-Hungarian identity and roots. And, and I think there are two parts to that, and let's take them apart. One is, uh, what is that sense of identity? And second, where does it come from, kind of the roots? Uh, the fact is that the Jewish Hungarians in, uh, in, in Kati's book, it was true for my father, it's true for a lot of people, thought of themselves first and foremost and always as Hungarians who happened to be Jewish. 
Most of them were secular. They were not religious. They just happened to be Jewish. And they were very intensely proud of being Hungarian. They were very in, in, in indoctrinated and, and integrated uh, into the Hungarian culture. And this is particularly true in that period right before and right after the First World War. Things were good for Jews, particularly those in Budapest. Uh, they were absolutely um, influential, maybe even predominant, in the professions, in the universities, uh, in the arts, in the sciences. Life was good for them until it turned out not to be. Uh, it turned out not to be when they first put in these things called numerus clausus, which literally were um, quotas with numbers attached to them that said only this percent of Jews could be professors, only this percent of Jews could be doctors or lawyers or other things or, or in any other professions. And that, of course, was a signal that some bad things were going to come. And this was done by Hungarians before the Germans came along. And then many of them fled as a result of that, um, which we'll talk about in a second. But their identity was Hungarian. And for many of them, who fled and who went on to do great things, they always thought of themselves in Hung as Hungarians. And I don't really know where that comes from. Maybe you can give us a little bit of light on that. Why is it that they thought of themselves first and foremost as Hungarians and not as Jews? Well, one of the reasons is that while there, was, there were some events of anti-Semitism in Hungary, by and large, there was less anti-Semitic pressure in Hungary than in other countries like Austria, like Germany. And uh, Jews actually, particularly after the middle of the 19th century, they, they felt that things were looking good and getting better. And uh, part of that was that, that the government relied on the Jews for modernization and also to provide a majority because up until the turn of the century, turn of the 19th and the 20th century, ethnic Hungarians were actually in minority in Hungary. But because all the Jews at, at, at the time of census, they declared themselves Hungarian, um, that helped to create a majority, a, a slight majority, but a majority. So it was an, a mutual dependence and uh, the government tried as best as they could to suppress really strong uh, movements of anti-Semitism. For a while in the 19th century, in the 1870s, uh, there was a, a, blo a blood libel uh, trial where they were accusing some uh, provincial Jews with uh, murdering a little girl. But in a few years that, that blew over and for a while there was even an anti-Semitic party, but after like three or four years, they were voted out of the parliament because the government, and in fact the Habsburgs in, in the, at the head of the monarchy, they were really against such movements because uh, it, it, they, they felt that, that uh, the role Jews play, play in, in modernization is more important. So as a result, up until really uh, the Second World War, the uh, Jews primarily felt uh, Hungarian, uh, even those who, who were uh, religious, and even the Orthodox Jews, they, they felt strongly patriotic. And, uh, and though, because of the numerous clauses and other things, there, there were several waves of emigration. I mean, the first wave of emigration in the 20th century was related to the 1919 uh, communist uh, dictatorship, which lasted only a few months, but nevertheless, after it was a repression and uh, lots of Jews left. Um, in fact, I believe your uh, dad had some problems at, mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, the second wave of uh, emigration was after the 1920 numerous clauses law. Then the third wave of uh, emigration was uh, in the 1930s, um, then uh, the first so-called Jewish laws, but they were in fact anti-Jewish laws, were enacted. And there was like a succession of such anti-Jewish laws. And more and more people realized that uh, they have no future in Hungary and they left. 
And, um, and then the, the next wave of emigration was already after the Second World War, when again lots of people left uh, for various reasons. Lots of Jews left for various reasons. So that, that's about it. But, but all through it, uh, all these people, they felt intensely patriotic. And intensely Hungarian. what? Intensely patriotic and uh, Hungarian. Hungarian. Intensely Hungarian patriotic. Yes. Y you know, from my impression from the book written about my father and from Kati's book was in, in that period before they left, mm -hmm. in the 20s and 30s, um, they, they felt, especially in Budapest, because that was where um, most of them were born, and those, like my father, from the provinces emigrated when they were very, very removed, when they were very, very young. I think my father was four. But in Budapest at the time, um, they felt free to create, free to innovate. Life was actually very good. And uh, Budapest, unlike, for example, Warsaw, didn't really have ghettos in the way that we think of them. Uh, Budapest, uh, the, the people who lived even in the Jewish quarters, uh, by and large, didn't speak Yiddish. Uh, they were much more assimilated than in some of the other countries, uh, like Poland. Um, and, and I think that made them feel comfortable that they were not only proud to be Hungarian, but they could be Hungarian. They were totally in the flow of everything that was going on. There was a very vibrant, uh, what, what Kati calls, and my father used to call, a cafe society. People would go to theater, they would go to movies, then they would stay, hang out at the New York Cafe House and other places like that. And uh, it was a pretty sophisticated place, uh, often referred to back then as the Paris of the East, um, because life was, was like that, and they were very much in the flow of it. And then, of course, everything changed. And, and which leads to the question of, given that so many of them left and did well, um, what was it about that, uh, that coincidence that they were from Hungary, they left, and they did well? And by the way, it bears mentioning, I think it's very important to mention, that while this book uh, and some of the people we're talking about are very, very prominent, influential, world-famous people, uh, there are people like Michael Curtis, for example, in the book, who directed Casablanca, which a lot of people think is one of the best movies ever made. Um, that yes, there are these famous folks, but uh, there are lots and lots of others who are maybe not as famous, who left Hungary and then went on to do really good things and became very successful in business, in the sciences, in the arts, uh, across the board. And they're not as famous as some of these folks, but I think the, the brain drain of Hungary and the concomitant result of that, that they enriched the cultures um, and, and really the intellectual and, uh, life of so many other countries and, and the business life uh, just bears mentioning. There was an amazing number of very talented people who left. So what was it about the water in Hungary or the DNA in Hungary or something that spawned all this amazing creativity, almost disproportionate to the size of the country? They were only a relatively small country relative to Germany or Poland even. What was it about Hungary that spawned all this creativity and innovation? Well, we have to make a distinction uh, between Hungary as a whole and Budapest. The social structure uh, of Jews was completely, completely different in Hungary as a whole and in Budapest. While in Hungary as a whole, up until 1920, the Orthodox had a small but real majority. Uh, it was very close to half, half orthodox and half assimilated. And of course, all this had many shades. In Budapest, it could not have been more different. I mean, in Budapest, the assimilated represented, roughly speaking, 95% of the population. And the orthodox was a small minority and has even even smaller minority. And uh, so it was completely different, and all the, virtually all these people we are talking about who became famous and had a big career, they came from Budapest. And furthermore, they came from a very, very narrow slice of society. They were, uh, they came from fairly prosperous families. Typically, their parents, their father, 
created the money and uh, they did not have to at any cost and full energy earn money but they could devote their time to things that, that intellectually interested them but they were not as uh, uh, profitable. And also that uh, they were born in a very narrow time frame, a, a, a segment of time. They were virtually all born between 1880 and 1910. And many of them, uh, a substantial segment of them, went to the same high schools. So further narrowing this, this incredibly narrow slice of society. And because uh, they came from prosperous and educated families, they had lots of books at home, they carried the ambition of their parents who achieved uh, the wealth and, and the prosperity, but without the need of having to earn money by any means. And, and that left them, uh, left it open for them to, to pursue uh, intellectual uh, professions. And uh, in a paradoxical uh, way, I, I will get back to this later, but in addition to that, some of the traditional Jewish family traditions uh, uh, contributed to, to this fact that we are discussing. One was the uh, knowledge of several languages. Virtually all Hungarian uh, urban Jews, they spoke German. And so that, that made it easier for these people after the numerous clauses in 1920s to study in Germany. Most of them actually studied in Germany and started working in Germany and left in Germany uh, when Hitler came to power. But by that time they acquired some fame and uh, that made it easier for them to continue in other countries. Another feature that made it easier was the traditional greater mobility of Jews. Jews going back centuries were sort of conditioned that if opportunities arise somewhere else, then we can move. And uh, that helped. And uh, also the culture, of, uh, the cult of, of, of learning, which was very, very traditional, going back to religious learning, of course. But later on, it, it, it uh, also uh, was converted to learning in general, not religious, but secular as well. So all this combined, it, it predisposed them to have a successful career abroad. And uh, that's, that's really what happened. I don't really believe that uh, uh, overall Hungary uh, had more uh, talented people than in Poland or Russia, or more, more, more talented Jews than in Poland or Hung Russia. Here we are talking of a very, very narrow slice of, of, of society. You, you know, uh, Kathy in her book uh, mentions a number of times that the, uh, the kind of world anschauen for a lot of these folks at the time in Budapest was the word she uses is innovate or die, almost a pressure to create things. And she mentions uh, toward the end of her book uh, Andy Grove, uh, many of you know Andy uh, Grove, he founded Intel, Hungarian Jew came to America. He famously wrote a book uh, really about business uh, where his, uh, his main thing that he's remembered for, the name of the book is uh, <coughs> uh, Only the Paranoid Survive, Only the Paranoid Survive. And, and apparently Andy, when Kathy interviewed him, uh, said that, that on the original notion of Only the Paranoid Survive didn't come out of business, it came out of his experience way back in Hungary because he was persecuted as his parents were and he felt fear and he felt the need to survive. And that somehow carried forward to all the great things he did in corporate America. And, and actually, I'm going to read to you something on the subject of why somehow um, all of the oppression, which started with numerous clauses and got a lot worse with Eichmann later, um, why all of that may actually have had, inadvertently, of course, some positive impact. So um, this is from Kathy's book, uh, but I think it's pretty astute. So she says, in the third man, 
a pretty good movie, uh, which uh, one of the Hungarians actually produced, Horda, uh, and where um, Harry Lime is played by uh, Orson Welles. So her, in, the, in, in The Third Man, uh, she calls him Corda Stand-In, stand uh, Harry Lime uh, proclaims, quote, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, bloodshed. They also produced Michelangelo, Leonardo, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherhood, love, 500 years of democracy, and they produced the cuckoo clock. Um, and so, um, and, and then she goes on to say, uh, in this case, she's referring to George Soros and Andy Grove, both uh, successful Hungarians in America. He says, Soros and Grove echoed Lyme's words. They credited their reaction to the warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed of fascist and communist Hungary for their extraordinary achievements. Um, their outsiders drive, not only as Jews in anti-Semitic Hungary, but later as refugees, spurred their creativity, their hunger to make a mark. And, and if there is a common theme uh, throughout this, uh, it's to me anyway that, that they were outsiders even in Hungary. They certainly were outsiders when they left Hungary, wherever they went. And somehow that outsiderness of theirs, um, sort of on the outside looking in factor, um, influenced them in two ways. One is they had to prove themselves. They absolutely had to prove themselves. They had to make a mark. But second, because they were outsiders, they were, I think, more willing to think and act out of the box because they were not in any real box. They were outsiders, um, just to mix metaphors a little bit. Uh, but um, that, that, I thought, was a very astute thing. Do you agree with that? No, absolutely. And Eugene Wigner, who the uh, uh, physicist who won the Nobel Prize, also wrote something very similar that, that in a paradoxical way, emigration helped his career because he could not have achieved that had he remained in Hungary. And uh, well, because uh, the whole mentality of, of what you mentioned is, is, is the drive to, to achieve, to prove, and uh, the propensity for original thinking, not following the, the, the standard line, all that combined contributed to their success and, and fame. I think also, this is more cultural than anything, um, many of them thought of themselves and were cosmopolites. It's not the same as cosmopolitan because cosmopolitan was often used as a derogatory word for, uh, for Jews. They were you know, part of this world thing as opposed to part of the nation. But cosmopolite in the sense of being quite worldly, pretty sophisticated, um, and, and in some senses, set citizens of the world as well. And, and so when they went abroad, <coughs> since they did speak languages and they already had this kind of broader cultural milieu, uh, it was easier for them to adapt into the new country they went to, even though they were never fully integrated to where they went. But it was easier for them to adapt. I, I think that, no, you think that's true? No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there, there, there's a, a great irony in all this, and, and I'd like you to comment on it, and that is that if, if they hadn't fled and they simply stayed in Hungary, given all this intelligence and capacity that they had, would they have ever done the things that they did? I, I don't believe they, they would have done, even if, if not all the... the problems and social problems and anti-Jewish laws and all that, if all that had not existed, they still would not have achieved the same had they remained in Hungary. So also the, what, what you mentioned is the emigrant mentality of, of the, the desire to achieve at, at all costs. I mean, if, uh, that, that really gave them a drive and an ambition that combined with their talent help uh, them to achieve what they achieved. I think some of that, to be very prosaic about it, is if you've survived so many terrible things, um, it's pretty easy to take on new challenges and new risks. 
because compared to some of the things you've already been through, mm -hmm. these new risks and new challenges are much more manageable and much more in your control. It's what can I do for myself as a writer or as a filmmaker or as a photographer, whatever it is, uh, compared to how do I just stay alive because there's some bad people out to get me or some bad people who are out to restrict my freedom, which is what numerous clauses were. So in a way, you know, it becomes easier once you've been through tougher times. Yes. I'm not a sociologist, but it just <laughs> makes sense. Um, what, what's also interesting, and it's in Kati's book, is that many of these Hungarians who, re, as I said before, stayed Hungarians always. It, this was always like, you could take them out of Hungary, but you couldn't take Hungary out of them. And yet, most of the ones that portrayed in her, in, in her book refused steadfastly ever to go back to Hungary. My father, for example, refused to ever go back to Hungary. He had a sister there that he loved, would have loved to visit. She couldn't come out, he could go there, but he refused to go back to Hungary. And ironically, later in life, um, he actually lived in Berlin, but he would not go to Budapest. Kind of ironic in itself. Um, one of the people mentioned in Kati's book, Imre Kertes, who is a Hungarian who won the Nobel, Peace Prize, uh, Nobel uh, Literature Prize, um, similarly, maybe later he changed his mind, but he lived in Berlin, refused to go back to Hungary. And why is that, that there was this, I'm a Hungarian, but I will never set foot in Hungary again? Why is that? Well, uh, many of them re did return to Hungary to, to visit for family reasons, but uh, a large group of them, for various reasons, did not return. Well, they resented uh, the regime before Second World War for obvious reasons, because of anti-Semitism, for uh, anti-Jewish laws, and so on and so forth, numerous clauses, and so on. And they resented uh, the communist regime after the uh, after Second World War. So most of them did not live, or 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 they were already very very old when. Um, communism ended in Hungary, and uh, so they, they did not uh, return. Imre Kertész is a separate case, that's why one cannot broadly generalize. He, he was very much against, uh, initially, of, of uh, the Orban regime, the, the current uh, government in Hungary, and he much preferred to, to, to live in Berlin. And later on, when he got old and had health problems, then he returned and mm, did not make peace, but uh, sort of started to go a little bit easier on, on, on uh, the current Hungarian government. He became more forgiving. Right. More forgiving, exactly. So uh, it's, one should examine it case by case. It's, it's, it's not one size fits all. I, I can only speculate about my father's case. Um, as I said, he ended up uh, living in Berlin in the late 50s, early 60s, and before he ended up joining us here in the States. And as I said, never went back to Hungary. Um, and why is that? And I never asked him this, so I'm pure speculation. And it's not in the book, because she doesn't know either, the person who wrote it. But I think part of it is this, uh, and Kati mentioned this this morning when we spoke to her, about why she thinks some people never went back to Hungary. And that is that um, they felt that the Hungarians, like the Austrians and not like the Germans, never fully, um, never fully um, admitted and came to grips with all the bad stuff they had done. And that they lived in greater denial than the Germans ever did. And that's a historical fact. Uh, a more personal fact in my, my father's case is that he actually lived in Berlin in the 30s, and he had a good time there. It was a, at the height of when Berlin was a very um, uh, fun place to live. There was a lot of uh, uh, stuff going on culturally and intellectually there. And he even worked for a very prominent company called Ufa, which was the dominant uh, film company in Europe that made and produced and distributed movies. He was Ufa CEO in Hungary. So he had a nice relationship with the Germans until bad stuff happened, of course. But I think most importantly, the reason he and maybe others 
didn't go back to Hungary and had even greater resentment for Hungary than for Germany, is that he saw uh, that there were many Hungarians complicit in the killing of Jews, Hungarian Jews. And he blamed them for that. And I think, again, I'm speculating, that that was even worse than what the Germans had done. Because it's one thing for these invaders who come in and they bring in Eichmann and he makes it his job to kill the indigenous Jews. It's the worst thing when the indigenous people themselves turn on their own people. And again, I'm only speculating. It's a, it's a, a terrible thing to have to uh, compare from a moral standpoint who is worse among two very bad groups of people. But that's sheer speculation. Um, we're going to open it up for some audience questions in a minute. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to make a final comment since, uh, and this is a bit of a stretch, so forgive me. But we started off this conversation, and indeed the name of, of this uh, talk today is about identity uh, and, and, and the really this kind of complicated uh, joint identity between being Jewish and being Hungarian. Uh, when you look at, and I don't mean to get into a conversation about it, I just want to point out, when you look at um, the contemporary scene, uh, just say in America, uh, often referred to as identity politics, which is usually a pejorative, but there are issues of identity um, in our own midst. Uh, Jewish Americans are confronted often with this issue of identity as it relates to Israel. Are you more pro-American or are you more pro-Israel, particularly when some Israelis are doing things that some American Jews don't approve of? Uh, you have, uh, with African Americans, uh, a, a divide these days. Uh, they have both of those identities, but some are really much more respectful of 1776 and some more of 1699, which is a very current debate. Uh, you have among Hispanic Americans, uh, again, they're both of those things, uh, but you have some who are very, who are legal immigrants here and are against illegal immigration, and then you have a lot who are for illegal immigration. And that's a divide between how they think of themselves and what their foremost loyalty is. Uh, maybe that's too strong a word, loyalty. But th these, these issues of joint identity and sometimes ultimately conflicting identity um, are, are with us here today. And we were focusing on a very good example of it, which was in, uh, in Hungary. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, most of these Hungarian Jews, they did think of themselves as Hungarians in Hungary, and they thought of themselves as Hungarians out of Hungary. They didn't become more Jewish when they left. They weren't that Jewish to begin with. They were Hungarians first and foremost. And um, to this day, I guess they want to be thought of that way. Uh, David, I don't know how you want to handle uh, the Q&A, but if there are any people who have questions, we'll take them. Uh, yeah, I think we'll, um, I or my colleagues will just pass the mic to someone in the audience for the first question if we have a volunteer and then I'll go um, see what people are asking online. Any questions? Uh, so I'm sort of curious, what is it about the Hungarian identity when you take them out of Hungary that contributed to their success in the countries that they immigrated to? I don't believe that the Hungarian identity contributed to their success. Uh, the whole situation, the way they grew up in Hungary, coming from prosperous families, learning a cult of, le uh, uh, growing up with a cult of learning, uh, placing learning uh, to something very of, of high va value, and. Uh, also learning many languages, also uh, having the prosperous family background uh, available for them and, and able to, to work in, in less uh, profit make profitable uh, professions. All this combined, that contributed, all, all the things we mentioned. But while in itself, it's absolutely true that they considered themselves first and foremost uh, Hungarian and uh, 
probably the second place only as Jewish, but uh, being Hungarian did not really contribute to uh, their success. All the other factors contributed. Thank you. I, maybe uh, the converse of, 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 maybe there was something special about Hungarians, maybe there wasn't, as he suggested. Uh, there was an old kind of joke going around. In the old days of Hollywood, uh, there was a lot of Hungarians uh, as directors and as cinematographers. I think three, maybe four of the seven major studios were founded by Hungarians, uh, like Fox, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of Hungarians came to Hollywood and they said, well, you know, I'm gonna make my career here. And some guy went for an interview with some studio head and said, you know, I want the job. And they said, so what are your qualifications? And he said, well, I'm Hungarian. And the guy said, well, you also have to have talent, you know? So who knows? We shouldn't assume too much. Are there any questions from the audience that's not with us physically? Yeah, well, there's a very lively discussion in the chat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Go ahead, but, but a few people did actually put uh, questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, and I mean, this, this is a, expanding the topic uh, quite a bit, but uh, since you were talking about the return to uh, the question of return to Hungary, uh, and I think it's also just interesting for people to hear about. You were just in Hungary, Arnish. Yes. Um, so Arlene uh, Lakamowitz uh, asks, "How large is the Jewish population in Hungary today, and what is the atmosphere like for Jews today?" Uh, nobody knows an exact number because there is no census but that goes by religion or uh, religious background. But uh, general estimates uh, say that it's between 80,000 and 100,000, somewhere, somewhere there. And the vast majority of them uh, live now in Budapest, in part because uh, in World War II, Practically the whole uh, Jewish population in the provinces was systematically deported and a very large share of them, more than half of them perished in um, Auschwitz mainly. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, in Auschwitz in 1944, I believe about a little bit more than a million Jews perished and about a third of them were Hungarian. And um, at the same time, in Budapest, lots of people perished and lots of people were deported, including my mother. But uh, it was not quite such a systematic and total deportation as in the provinces. And so that's one of the reasons. And also after the war, the remaining provincial Jews frequently moved to Budapest because they just felt more comfortable there, so for various reasons. And also, the social structure changed because most of the Orthodox in Hungary, even before 1920, after the, the peace treaty of Trianon, or after uh, the peace treaty, most of the Orthodox and the Hasidim, they lived in the provinces. And uh, exactly those areas that after the peace treaty in 1920, they were uh, attached to surrounding countries and no longer were parts of, of Hungary. And also because of the, la the, the systematic uh, deportation of most of the provincial Jews, a much larger share of the Jewish population perished from the provinces than uh, a much, much larger share of the Orthodox and Hasidim uh, perished in the Holocaust uh, than the assimilated, many of, whose, many of whom were in Budapest where uh, there wasn't such a systematic deportation. Yeah, from what little I know, I'm hardly an expert on contemporary hung Hungary, uh, but from what I've read and heard, um, there are about 100,000 Jews there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the political situation is such, uh, Viktor Orban was just reelected. Uh, Viktor Orban, who originally started off as a rabid anti-Soviet, glad it's liberated, has turned out to be a, even pre-Ukraine, 
of a good friend of Putin's and even today uh, refuses to condemn what's going on over there. He won this last election uh, because the, and he's often been accused of not being outright anti-Semitic, but certainly not pro-Semitic. But he won this election because there was a coalition running against him, which was a really strange coalition of extreme left and extreme right. And on the extreme right, they had rabid anti-Semites who still, still have a fair amount of support in Hungary, even though there are only 100,000 or so Jews left. And so compared to this coalition, which didn't make a lot of sense because they had people on the left, on the right, including people on the right, as we said, who were uh, outright even worse anti-Semites than he is, um, he was able to win. And, and he plays that game. Uh, he has, I think, uh, over the years, uh, portrayed himself as a pretty good friend of Israel. He had pretty good relations with Netanyahu. Um, so um, I, I would say, from what little I know, that today, Hungary, despite all of its history and despite the paucity of Jews there, is still not a really pro-Jewish place. On the other hand, many of the Jews have assimilated to such extent that they don't identify themselves that much as Jews anyway. Well, I just read a few days ago a um, scholarly article about anti-Semitism in 20 European countries. And uh, Hungary was among the three countries with the worst yeah. uh, anti-Semitism. That was like uh, uh, a poll where they were polling uh, average people, everyday people, not famous people or politicians, and polling uh, several thousand people in, in each country. So it, it shows a fairly realistic picture of the situation of in all these countries. And unfortunately, in Hungary, um, uh, is one of the where the strongest anti-Semitism is the strongest. Do you have another question from the field, so to speak? If not, we'll wrap it up. Sure. Um, well, a, a couple questions from uh, uh, from the Zoom audience for Andras about food, and I think that maybe would be a good place to. <laughs> That's a great play to, to, to this end thing. it um, before we go out um, and and enjoy some refreshments together. So uh, for Dr. Kerner, um, <laughs> no doctor. Doctor, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I'm just I'm just reading here. Uh, what is your favorite recipe from your cookbook, and how are your recipes distinguished from other Hungarian cuisine? That's an interesting question about German Jewish cuisine too. But in the mm -hmm. Hungarian case, what are your favorites, and how are they different from the average Hungarian? Well, strictly cuisine? speaking, I, I I have not written any cookbooks. Uh, if they have recipes, they are part of a cultural history of the of culinary culture, and uh, I, I quote recipes usually uh, exactly the way they were published in the 19th century. It would be very difficult to cook from them. So, uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, it's highly interesting that at least in the 19th century was Hungary in the absolute forefront of the world uh, in, in publishing Jewish cookbooks, including the world's third Jewish cookbook was published in 1840 in Pest, uh, in Pressburg, I'm sorry, in, in Bratislava. And uh, also the, the world's first uh, cookbook I printed in Hebrew letters, mind you it was in German, but it was printed phonetically in Hebrew letters and that came out in 1854 in Budapest. And in the overall number of Jewish uh, cookbooks published in the 19th century, um, only uh, England and Germany published more than Hungary, but not much more. So, and, and all the subsequent, all the countries, other countries, including the Russian Empire, which was by far the which had the by far the largest Jewish population in the at the end of the 19th century, about 5.8 million people, in, because Russia at that time included uh, Poland and included uh, um, Lithuania and a, and a bunch of other uh, Baltic countries. So it had a huge population. And nevertheless, if they published only like two or three 
Jewish cookbooks in the 19th century. And for example, in the United States also, which had a very large Jewish population already at the end of the 19th century, published far fewer Jewish cookbooks in the 19th century than Hungary. And uh, meaning Hungary by itself, Hungary of course at that time was part of the monarchy, but when I'm talking of Hungary, I examine only those cookbooks that were published in the historic area of, of Hungary. So uh, in terms of Jewish culture, it, it, this was quite, quite amazing, and the reason was uh, a relatively large population, albeit um, much less than in, in the Russian Empire, but nevertheless, at that time, Hungary had about eight, 850 or so thousand Jews, and a much larger share of them were assimilated, and a much larger share of them were more or less comfortably off than, say, in Poland. And uh, Jewish cookbooks were typically published for middle class people. And even though the Jewish cookbooks were kosher cookbooks, but they expressed the desires of, of uh, uh, Jews who started to become assimilated, at least in language, uh, in uh, clothing, in schooling, but not yet in, in religion. So I would suggest to the person not having looked at your book, Andras, but I will, <laughs> that she buys Andras's book, uh, takes all the recipes, tastes all of those things, and makes her own decision on what her favorite is, since uh, he, wasn't, he didn't really answer her question. Um, and not a bad idea. No, Buy no, the no. book, do the cooking, make it up for your own mind. Not a bad way to go. Mm -hmm. um, should we wrap it up, you think? Yeah, um, and, um, I, think, I think so. I mean, there's a, a small If there's any other question, we'll, we'll take it. Otherwise, yeah, we'll wrap we it up. we take the conversation and, outside. And do you want to tell them what's waiting outside? Is there a reception or? Yeah, no? we'll there we have some somebody who, outside. who wants to ask a question. There. Oh, there is one. <laughs> Hell if I know. You, you know that my friend Tom Pifford would ask a question like that. You, know. uh, you mean, what does it mean to the Hungarian who is the Hungarian outside of Hungary, or? Oh, that's an interesting question. Hey, uh, you go I first, and I'll, I'll, I'll I go second. I cannot deny it because of my accent, so it's <laughs> obvious, no? <laughs> and uh, of course, in a uh, joking aside, um, it's the literature, it's the culture, uh, the, something that, that one grew up with and one carries inside of one's person uh, with him or her, and, uh, and that stays, and uh, that's, part of uh, one's personality and even after more than 50 years that I have been living in, in the United States, uh, of course I pay special attention to uh, new Hungarian literature and music and uh, cultural events. It's, it's natural, it's part of me. It's, a, it's really a great question. I, I, I don't have any empirical data or any historical or sociological framework for it. I can only talk from my own experience as the son of two Hungarians who had a lot of Hungarian friends. Uh, some of the children of those Hungarian friends of my parents are here tonight. Um, and I'm glad to see you here. Um, it seems to me now that you've asked and you've forced me to think about this, that's what he does every time. It's, um, if there was a couple of things that they had in common, other than just being Hungarian, um, there was a certain curiosity uh, about what was going on in the world. Uh, there was a certain liveliness in their personas and in how they interacted with other people. They were lively people. Um, they liked to eat. Now I know why. Um, <laughs> they liked to have a good time. And while they were I think not overly burdened by their past. They didn't talk about it that much. Um, it stayed in them in many ways. And they were, in some respects, despite all their joie de vivre and wanting to have a good time, um, 
somewhat serious as well. There was a seriousness about them in a way. Um, and several of them um, in my father's circle, uh, my mother's circle, were really quite erudite. They read a lot. They knew a lot. Uh, maybe that was out of that curiosity. But there was a, a certain Hungarianness about them uh, that was different from uh, what I saw with other types of people, not anything better or worse, just something about them. I can't be more precise than that. But uh, it was pretty pervasive. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I, I would say the other thing among many of them, uh, even ones not as famous as these folks, there, there was a certain creativity. They, 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 I mean, I, I remember people in the New York so scene of, of, since you already talked about food, um, some of the very prominent people in the food industry in New York, like George Lang, uh, who had uh, Café des Artistes, for example, was a well-known guy. Uh, used to come to our house, and my father would do the cooking. He was very good at that, much better than my mother. And George would salivate at the food that he was being served. He loved to eat. Uh, Tommy Margatai and Paul Covey famously ran and built the Four Seasons restaurant in New York, two Hungarian guys. Um, and uh, anyway, I, that's the best I can do. But I'll think about it some more. Thank you. Anyway, thanks thank for you. coming. Rafael, Andres, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you outside. Thank you for coming.